Hello everyone, welcome to the second episode of Talking Cello, quarantine edition this time. I'm going to make it uh, via Skype call with Kian Soldani. Here, he will be here facing me with the iPad. Um, we will just have the same conversation as we had before. And we are going to respond to some of the questions that you posted in the comments. Um, that's pretty much it. Let's go into it. All right, man. So, uh, just a few things that people were talking about. Uh, one of the main uh, topics uh, they were talking about memory which I never really thought about it much, but I'm starting to think about it more since I'm getting older. Um, before I used to learn things by heart just like this, no problem. I, how do you learn it by heart? I just practice it and get it. And now, uh, with, with the new pieces that I'm learning, I need to make a conscient, conscient effort to learn it. If it's by, for example, uh, the triple concerto, the rondo, which I had to play by heart for the first time now. Um, I had to figure out how to do it. And I want to ask you, how do you do it first? Yes, it's quite similar actually for me. When I was younger, I would also just do it. You know, you just practice and practice until basically you just know it by heart automatically. And I think it very much depends on the piece, of course. Let's say if there's some sweet melody by Tchaikovsky, some romance or, you know, elegie, I think that's very much still the case. It just stays with you because it's a melody. I think the more abstract the structure or the melody, the harder or the less natural it will just stay in your brain. In your, for your example of the, the rondo of the triple concerto, which is the third movement, I think it's specifically hard, of course, because you're not always the main voice. I think the hardest are the pieces where you are not always some sort of melody. You are also accompanying, then you're some kind of you know, secondary voice, uh, third voice, and then you're again the main voice. So those things are, of course, more difficult. For me, which I, what I've learned over the time, when I do learn those kind of pieces that are not naturally just staying in your brain, it's very important to also have an understanding of the structure of the piece. That is extremely important that you understand why it's like that. Because most of the times, there is a reason for that. I mean, there is of course very, very crazy exceptions of, of atonal pieces like that have absolutely no logic. That is, must, be, must be incredibly difficult. I don't think I've ever learned a piece by heart that had no logic whatsoever. I can only imagine that's almost impossible. Um, most pieces, almost all of them, certainly Beethoven or even the more modern composers, they have some logic in their structure, in the way they've written it. There is almost some mathematical quality to it. And if you understand that, then it will be much easier for you to really keep it in your brain because you understand why it is like that. And when you understand why, it's also faster to really keep it in your brain. For me, that was, that was definitely one step that I had to take and that would really speed up the process. I don't know how it is for you. Yeah, no, completely the same. For me, the, the key was to understand, as you say, uh, what is happening. And so, continuing with the triple, uh, my, I just took the score, uh, the, the whole memorizing thing, you can do it without the instrument, not even. Just have to take the score and understand, okay, so what's happening? Why is this going here? If sometimes the problem is that the same thing goes in one direction with uh, a note changes and then it goes into a completely different direction no so these kind of things are usually tricky and then for me it was just like okay just rationally understanding this when I play this thing it goes here and then I memorize that and then when I go here you know so the same um, has I thought memorizing had only to do with practicing over and over but it has more to do with understanding with your, you know, more than with your mind than your with your fingers. I mean, it's a combination. Yes, uh, I think even with those melodies that I was referring to, which automatically stay in your brain, I think they 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 stay in your brain faster because you understand it faster. These are things that are more impulse impulsively logical for us. A beautiful melody is for us 
easier to understand than some kind of rondo structure with different uh, cadenzas and stuff, but both of them are understanding. So even a simple melody, you know it by heart because you understand the melody. It's just different levels of understanding, but that's why it's harder to understand the other stuff, but it's equally important. Because of the nature of this setup, it makes not much sense to, to play because, first of all, it's not gonna, I'm not going to hear you very well, you're not going to hear me very well. So it's good that we speak about some, some deeper things, but I do have a practical question still, so that we can uh, at least cover one thing, which is um, Rococo. So, the last variation. I've seen you do a different fingering than I do in one place, and I want to maybe we can present to our uh, watchers these two different options and the, the two maybe advantages or disadvantages of them. So I'm talking about this place, and then... And then that's what I do. And then I always shift on this note. Shift. That's what I do. But it's it's hard. I'm never really satisfied with it. So I'm looking for an alternative. And I saw you do something else. Yeah, I I try to keep it always in by blocks. similar with the fingering. I think the most difficult difference is in the very beginning. How do you do again? So you do... Can you repeat? You stay in all, all the first three blocks you stay in one position. Yeah. And then you change. Yeah, I do... Yeah. Basically, the, the accent is always... Wow. Yours is probably better, right. especially in the beginning. And people at home now watching and wanting to try out those fingerings, uh, there is you know an option on YouTube where you can slow down the video to 0 0.5 or even 0 0.25 or something like that. If you really want to see mm -hmm. in detail the fingerings we just did, slow, go back to the video, go back a minute, slow it down to 0 0.25 and you will see precisely what we did. If you want to try out those fingerings, it's going to be very easy for you to decipher that because it's not going to be possible for us now to block, break down every position shift. So just do your little homework yeah. and go back, slow down the video, if you want to try out those two different fingering options, and then to see which one is better for you. Yeah. Um, I try to avoid as many changes as possible. So, so if I can avoid, you know, in general, a change, I will try to do it. Can I tell you the um, other one? This one... Uh, yeah. I do. Ah. Oh, That's wow. Walter Deschpey, uh, by the way, who told me this. Again, last episode I spoke about Walter Deschpey. Again, I speak about Walter Deschpey. This finger. Let me try again and let me see if I can get it in tune this time. So... And then third finger. Yeah. And then thumb. These three are in all in one position. And then you need to... And then... Only for the last one you wow. put the thumb there. It's a bit complicated, I have to say, but it sort of works. Uh, show us your option, because I think you... I, I, I start with two. And then, for me, I go to one, because it's the, it feels very natural. That's how I look for fingers. That's a good one. Yeah, Rokogo has so many things. How do you do the, the scales? The... I always do the same. Four times the same, basically. <laughs> I always switch on the, the note after the, uh, the main note, E in this case. Right after the E, you switch. One. 
switch. Switch. And the last one, of course, you have to do it normally. But, and then thumb position. And then normal. What about you? We can very much establish that you love to shift uh, as much as possible. <laughs> That's what, what we are learning from this video, and I, I, I hate to say it. <laughs> I, I just completely don't. The whole thing is the same. Yeah. Of course, it's possible. But to... here feels a bit awkward. The reason I am I'm not doing that, the reason I'm going uh, shifting more and more is, is because for the last run, once I arrive here, I only have this one run to make on the same string. I'm, uh -huh. I'm slightly worried about my same string runs. I feel like I'm not completely solid with those, mm -hmm. so I try to avoid it as much as possible. You, your fingering is nice, but you have two octaves to make on the same string, which you are super yeah, strong with that, so true. do it. It's true. But for me, that's a little bit scary. Yeah, it, it feels it feels a long a long way. That's true. And both of them basically you only have to practice one of them because the second one is identical. Uh, so that's uh, that's what mm -hmm. is good about this fingering. But everything works or nothing works mm -hmm. depends. <laughs> but, or nothing works more more commonly. <laughs> um, what about this? This. Logical, naturally speaking, I got used to it now, so it works. But I think a lot about fingerings for some reason. I think when something doesn't work or if something keeps being hard, it's probably the fingerings. You no? can. Don't you agree? That is, I myself change fingerings often if something. So I I try to perfection it um, the fingerings. Until nothing works and I just play like one 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 one. <laughs> Another question in fingerings. Um, in Dvorak, one of the most awkward moments in musical history, I think. The... How do you do? I played, I think, every possibility, but now I'm playing. And before I used to play. I mean, it makes no difference, but it always feels stupid. How do you play that? I think the, I think how you're playing it now, logically speaking, makes more sense because before you were shifting with the bow, yeah. which is n never a smart thing. And then you have to hide that. With now, it's better because you can use the the time when the bow is in the air anyway to do the shift. That's definitely how I do it now. In general, I think one when one tries to decide bowings, 
uh, no, fingerings, that it should somehow also be related to the bowing. Ideally, you know, try to not shift uh, when it's a big legato line. Try to, if you possible, do the shift when the bow is anyway in the air or something like that. So that's really something I try to always keep in mind is to find, number one, when I shift, is, is it possible to do it when the bow is in the air or not completely sostenuto? Or number two, if that's not possible, can I find a half note where I can shift? Because that is always sounding smoother than a full note. So those, those two rules definitely help. Or just even with the change of the bow, no? It doesn't even need to be in the air. Just when mi fa sol, fa. Whenever yeah. you change the bow, it's a good moment to, to edit. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> to make a little yeah, Photoshop you know, with your fingers. <laughs> tell me, tell me, I have a question, since we're talking about Dvorak, yeah. how do you practice the, the ten bars of death, I call them, <laughs> of, 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 of horror? <laughs> I, I don't think there is a place in cello repertoire that is so weird. Like it's supposed to sound fun and like <laughs> folk music, but it's so strange to play, and it's so unpredictable. Also in the concert, yes. <laughs> this is really one of the top one of the top five easily. So tell me how you how you do it and how you practice well, first it. First of all, even, is there even a chance? I, without any shame whatsoever, thirty minutes before I have to play that note. <laughs> I, I, I just I just look for it and with no shame. I look at the concert master and I'm like I got it, I got it. <laughs> and then we share a moment of like half half I don't care man. <laughs> um what, how I practice is just I try that what we said, um always the the, the left hand always faster and I just stop but this this place it is it is unpredictable sometimes I have to admit that I am surprised in the concert of the result I'm like sometimes for a good way and sometimes in a bad way like okay well that that was that <laughs> I take it I take it man whatever I actually have um, I do it slightly different than you know I just noticed okay. I do, of course, but then I still play this note in the same position, and then I change now, and I play very out of tune, and then again, and then I change. You change always after the, I change in the middle of it. I think maybe yours is probably better, I think because but it's too late for me to change I do it because I feel it has more time, there's a lot of time between this. And then this, it then that those those two notes, they you don't have so much time, so that that stresses me a lot more. So I just change whenever I have more time. That was my reasoning. That is better. I personally have never heard a cellist who doesn't go. <laughs> Can you give me, yeah? Okay, thank you. Go! <laughs> I, have, I have yet to find a chest. I also do it completely shamelessly. <laughs> but I want to see somebody who just goes like... <sighs> I mean, I want to see somebody like that, but that's that's not gonna be I me. Even, that's not me. Maybe Rosa did it like that. I even asked for an A to the elbow. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's what I do. I actually come, I, I leave the stage after the second movement. I put my finger there. I come on stage like this. I ask somebody else to play the first phrase of the movement, the first <laughs> yes, somebody, the principal cellist, <laughs> and I'm ready, and then I just go. <laughs> yeah, just kidding, for the people, who, it was a joke, <laughs> but, um, oh. do you, do you yeah, feel, do you try to, um, I always try to be prepared though, like whenever there is, uh, if there is a tutti and then I have to hit the high note, I always try to be there a bit earlier. Do you do you feel like that? Like do you like to be there prepared or you are like waiting like this, like a brave man and then you whatever it is. Depends. It really depends because certain positions in the cello are more natural. Like, you know, if you just have to hit the, the D, like let's say second movement of Schumann. This is really what I try because I think the music is so like, 
oh, it's so intuitive or whatever. So when the, when the orchestra introduces the second movement, and then you come, uh, right? You enter like this, and the D. I mean, this is yeah. one of the most archaic positions uh, for the cello. So I think I'm, I'm fairly confident with hitting that. That's why I don't search for it. But this, I'm, I'm so not confident with that. So of course I search for it. But what is, what is your approach? There is one th place in the cello literature where I'm torn. Of course it's I'm talking about last movement, Frank. What do you do? Do you go full risk or do you prepare it? Both times. Always prepare it. I do like this. I never, I never take a chance because I just, I just don't want to be like in the music in the moment. Oh yeah. I, I don't think I can recover. I'm not strong enough to recover from that man. <laughs> Any mental preparation that we just exactly. spoke of before, that's not going to help you in this Out case. The <laughs> that is. <laughs> then, then I will have to break a string to pretend it was the string that broke. No, it, it's going to be a expensive oh, yeah. concert. <laughs> oh, look at the bow. Like, oh man, look at the bow again. Look at the pianist. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Totally messed up. <laughs> 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 That's actually, there is a trick, guys. If you really feel like you messed up something and there is no mental recovery, look at somebody in the orchestra and shake your head like, like it was totally their fault and they, like, they totally, you know, irritated you in a way. And then people will be distracted. That might help. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, sometimes a thing that happened to me uh, a couple times, do you know when it happened to you that you are supposed to play some part and you don't enter and you're like, who the f***? <laughs> Who the hell is not playing? And it's you? <laughs> Something is missing. And, and you're upset, and you're like... Oh. <laughs> I want to ask you something that anyway I think is interesting for also the people at home. I think something that many people don't speak about so much and that is sometimes misunderstood or like frowned upon, you know, smiled at, is body language very much. So people have, or not people in general, some people may have the misunderstanding that if you move with the music, you are trying to make a show or some sort of theater or it's fake, you know, or like, you know, it's not real, it's not mm -hmm. genuine. What do you think, how important is body language? Do you think of that when you come on stage? Do you think it changes the way you play? Are you trying to communicate something? Or is it just naturally happening to you? Do you work on it? What, what is your approach to that? Um, there is two things. Uh, when, first of all, when I play and when I listen to music, instinctively my body reacts to it. So I'm always going to move a little bit. I don't think I could listen or play completely still. Um, also because when I see myself, if there is a recording of the concerts and I see myself playing like super still, it bothers me. I don't know why. I like to see myself feeling free um, and, and moving with the music, which is crazy because when I see someone else, I don't see it. Like when I see maybe Sokolov or even, you know, I don't know, Marta Agritz and Sophie Mutter, they don't move much when they are playing. And I never miss it. I'm like, oh, I wish they would move a little bit more. But when I look at myself, I'm like, ah, oh, you're so stiff, so rigid. And uh, so in, when I see, I, I like to see myself moving freely. And I think, I, I don't do it for the audience, to be honest. I do it for myself. I think I feel it more when I move. When I move. I've tried to not move so much, but I just, I just cannot do it. I, I I like to do it. What about you? Do you think do do you move? Do you try to move a bit bigger when you are on stage, or do you try to move even less to have more control? How do you what do you think? What do you think? For me, I I just I just simply cannot help it. Really, when I get on stage and I get this you know adrenaline kick, it just makes me you know give everything uh, in every aspect. You know, I I try to give my best playing. I also try to give my best emotionally. So I think the moment I get involved emotionally, my body just reacts to that. And I think that's not a bad thing. I really don't try to do more or something on purpose, but I think it just happens. Just like for you, it just happens because the stage energy makes you do that. But 
I think in general it's good because it, somehow this moving your body it, it loosens you up a little bit and you might even get rid of some maybe nervousness and the stiffer you get of course your sound also suffers from it you need to go with the phrase you need to sometimes go with the bow and where the music takes you so to stay stiff uh, I think it, it would actually make the performance suffer don't move on purpose for theatrical purposes but when you do feel stiff on stage loosen up like in sport or anything loosen up with your body and it does help to maybe project more to be more confident on stage try to be more loose on stage i think being loose that's important don't make any big gestures just for the sake of it you know like finishing the, the phrase and you're like <sighs> <laughs> yeah. that makes no sense no. yeah no, it but has, loosen it, up extra musical yeah Let's, let's forget about uh, the audience for a second. If you play with an orchestra, you need to also inspire the members of the orchestra. So if they see somebody mm. sitting there and um, maybe it's perfect or anything, but um, mm. that doesn't inspire. You need to take them with you. You almost have to become a conductor mm. on, on your own. What does a conductor really do at the end of the day? Some most musicians don't need one, two, three, four. Like it's clear where the one is in the two and three. Most people need some sort of inspiration and some energy, and you can also do that. It's also your job. It's not just the conductor's job. At least that's what I think. I that that point that you just said, I agree a hundred percent. When I'm playing with the orchestra, I always try to play with the orchestra. I, sometimes you, you see me, many people just playing their part as a soloist. They don't want to have anything to do with the orchestra. I like to play. It's like a big chamber group for me. For me, it makes me much calmer. Uh, if I am a bit nervous, if I start to move it, I forget completely about the nerves. And I think the music making is so much better. No? The, the orchestra feels like the, uh, you are m making music together. I think it's just, it's a, it makes really good energy. Yeah, yeah I agree. And, and this, is a good, this is a good segue into another question that people were asking us in the comments. How to fight um, stress? on stage uh, because that's is this is probably this is probably something that we have to deal with no all our life uh, music is performed on stage so in front of people um many people really struggle a lot with it i wanted to ask you first how how you deal with nerves if there is any and tell the people the reality because i think people sometimes they see uh, you know other musicians that they ad admire and they they don't they cannot imagine that they go through the same thing as they do yeah it's a big topic of course and we can speak for hours about it <laughs> but uh, i can try to summarize it a bit in that of course in the earlier years i don't think again same as what did we speak of before the memorizing thing same as that in the earlier years you don't really think about it too much you just you just do it and also stage fright was not a thing for me in the earlier years but then the more you start to reflect on things in general on life on yourself the more you start to question yourself also when you're on stage of course so it only becomes a problem i think later in your life and the big problem of course is yourself that is always the person that is stopping you and that is making you nervous is yourself. I mean, it's not the audience who is like yelling stuff at you and being like, boo, or like, don't mess up, don't mess. Nobody ever does that. I mean, if they do, uh, I would be very surprised. I have never experienced that. The audience is not the problem. You know, the orchestra is not the problem. It's you. You are the only one who is putting those thoughts in your brain. So the only solution is to not allow yourself to do that to yourself anymore to understand that it's nonsense that it's only harmful to think like that like to be afraid of failure or to be afraid of messing up or to be judged by the audience to be judged by the orchestra all of those things they only come from your from your brain from overthinking so that's the process that you need to just cut and it's hard and it's a big process i think and it's a some some challenge that you will be facing for the rest of your life but it's important to start doing that and the best way is to not do it once you're already on stage because it might be too late because the stress will not help you have to start thinking about that before you need to start practicing on that of letting go of your negative thoughts cutting that link realizing that it's not you that it's just some stupid thoughts that should have nothing to do with you and that is ridiculous to have them so meditation i guess would be the word 
uh, that would help or just a simple understanding of that process. Uh, for me, a big eye-opener was, was the book that I read by Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. I'm sure many people know this and I'm not the first one to speak about it, but it's famous for a reason because it really has some very, very powerful ideas of exactly those things, letting go of negative thoughts in your brain. So I really tried to work with that book and it has helped me tremendously. And now I go on stage and I don't think about failure anymore because there is no such thing as failure on stage as long as you emotionally transmit the music, as long as you're free and are having fun and touch someone in the audience, you, you cannot have failed, it's impossible. Missing one note here and there, that's not failure, it simply isn't. So you have to really shift your understanding of what it means to be successful on stage. For me it has become being free on stage and communicating freely and having fun on stage. If I've managed to do that, I leave the stage happy and I don't ever look back and I was just happy with that concert. Even if I missed one or two notes, who cares? So for me that was a very important step. What about you? Yeah. Um, yes, it's, I mean, it, it's everything completely what you said. It's everything in, in our head. Uh, it's, but somehow there is something about the concert, no? That is like, sometimes you do a dress rehearsal with a hundred people sitting there or 500 and you are like super chill. The chill is, uh, you are playing your best. What happens to me when I'm relaxed, I'm playing my best. And then it's the concert, and maybe it can be even the same amount of people, and suddenly you're, or it can be like two people in the concert, and suddenly you're like, whoa, be careful, I don't miss this note. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's something about the concert yeah, totally. that is just like, it changes something. And doesn't matter how relaxed I am in the concert, I will never be as relaxed as in a dress rehearsal or something like this. I don't know why. Um, now, what I'm doing is, like two, three hours before the concert, I'm already putting myself in like a positive attitude, just completely positive, good energy. Um, I, I start to do it two, three hours before because I realize that then by the time that the, it's time to to perform, I'm already in, in, in a great state of mind. I think if I leave it, what you said, if I leave it to the last moment, also what you said, when I practice, I try to put myself, I try to visualize myself I'm playing on stage, I think that helps. Also, when I was in New Orleans earlier this year, um, an NFL player came to my to my concert, and then after the con yeah, really? and then after the concert, I, I asked him like, hey, I, I admire you guys so much, you athletes, you have such great uh, mental strength, and um, I think in classical music, maybe we are not as strong, you know, sometimes it has happened to me in the past that if a concert is not going as well as I would like or I'm feeling bad for some reason, uh, I tended to go like a bit more like down uh, in my mentality. And I think like, what do you do? What do you do when you miss a goal or whatever you do? I feel like, you know what? I'm, even if I, his job was to catch the ball in, you know, someone throws it, he catches it, I'm like, so that was his job. Like, even if I drop the ball, I'm gonna, in my mind, I'm gonna see it as I took it, as I catch it. So I'm only seeing positive things. And I'm like, wow, okay. So now I started to implement that. And even if I miss a shift, I'm like, immediately after, instead of be like, oh shit, I missed it, I'm like, you nailed it. And then I just continue from there. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> <laughs> even if something, it, so I crazy. think it's a good, it's a good, state of mind because sometimes even it, it has happened to me before I'm playing a good concert and then in the second movement or whatever like long into the concert I miss a note or something or a shift or whatever and then for the next three minutes I'm like oh man you know it has happened to me before and like now I'm like boom after a second I'm like gone that was great boom next next thing um, it has helped me a lot and lately I'm working so much in that, I, I'm feeling the best on stage lately. I just go with, with no fear whatsoever, I just go completely positive and like, this is what I'm doing and in, in that way I, I, I admire you a lot because I think your mental strength is, is really impressive. Uh, I've never seen you with a uh, bad attitude on stage, or, but maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. That, that's just the impression I get from, from outside. I try. I try. 
I also try what you said, just to stay positive. And what has really helped me it was like an eye opener. I think I, I wrote you this when this happened to me about a year ago. I had a really negative experience on stage when um, I started the concert, a very important concert for me, and then the strings just went yeah. down. I think I told you this. The strings went down. It was such an important concert for me. Everyone was there that I really wanted to impress, you know, very negative attitude to begin <laughs> with. Um, the strings went down and it was a radio recording as well. So I had to finish the movement with completely out of tune strings and I was like down. I was like, why is this happening to me? I'm such a victim. I'm such a <laughs> horrible mental attitude. I was really ashamed that I even thought like that. And then I continued the concert with a negative energy. I continued with a negative energy until the end of the concert, but I, I, I played everything else. I mean, I tuned the strings, of course. <laughs> and then, of course, they had to cut out that piece. They had to cut out that piece where, where the strings went down, but the rest of the concert, they streamed. And I listened back to it, and I was like, when I was on stage at that time, I was like, I sound so bad. This is horrible. This is the worst. I'm really like messing up and everything. And then I listened back to it, and I was like, this really doesn't sound bad, actually. It really doesn't sound back, bad. And I was so ashamed of not just enjoying the moment while I was there because I could have enjoyed it so much more now knowing that it actually it really didn't sound bad at all. It was sounding quite okay, really acceptable. And I could have enjoyed it much more. That was an eye-opening experience for me to understand that no matter how bad you think it is sounding, it really, there is no way that it ever sounds as bad as you <laughs> think it does. It, there is no way that it sounds as bad as you think it does. It always sounds better than you think because your voice in your head is making it 10 times worse. From then, that moment on, every time I felt on stage like, well, I don't think I'm sounding good, I always be like, no, must be wrong, must be bullshit, I'm probably sounding quite okay right now. So it put me immediately in a good mood. And then I would listen back to the radio and I was like, yeah, I was right. That moment where I thought, oh, every, there's always this moment of panic where like, oh, I think every, everything's going down to the from now. That's the moment you have yeah. to stop yourself. And I, every time I would listen back to the radio and I would rem remember that moment, of course, I would be like, that moment where I thought it's going downhill, it sounds just as fine as everything else before. So, and I learned to catch myself in that moment and then I just stayed there mm -hmm. mentally. Uh, and I stay positive and the rest of the concert stays positive. It's very important to know that it's not as bad as you think. It really is not. Completely agree. Another practical tip for everyone who is just starting. Um, I think it helps a lot to start to get rid of the nerves. Is just to do it a lot, no? When you play for your friends. I mean, the first times that you play for someone, it's always stressful. And it's always going to be a tiny bit stressful. So just do it. Get used to play for your friends, get used to play you know, for your teacher, for your mom, for your grandma, it doesn't matter for who you play. The more that you do it, the more comfortable you will, you will be with it, no? Yeah, of course, absolutely. Exercise, practice makes perfect, also on stage. Not just home practice, but stage practice. Completely. I agree. How do you do it with Lutov Lasky, man? Because I think you play Lutov Lasky also by heart. No? I do. I do play that by heart. It might surprise many people, but there's so much logic in that piece, actually. It's, it's, it's completely, from beginning to end, very clear in the structure and in the way he writes it. It might sound to somebody who hears it for the first time like it's just a random collection of notes. And of course, many people criticize this kind of music by saying it's just nonsense. But of course it's not. Lutoslavsky is an absolute genius composer and actually he also studied mathematics, which is a very, very important realization to make when you play his music. Wait a second, this guy studied mathematics and now he's writing music like this. There must be some sort of connection. And there absolutely is. There is so much math in this composition, which doesn't mean, does it make it any less mm -hmm. good as a musical piece? He has managed to combine these two worlds in a, in a way which is so powerful, in my opinion. So the way I learned Tostavsky by heart, it's really not as crazy difficult as people think. Some people think it's impossible. It's really not, but it's very important to do that step which I just spoke about, which is to understand how it's built. It's very clear in its structure. It has very clear um, sections and uh, movements and, and things that belong together. So you have to just mm -hmm. divide the piece up in sections, in smaller and smaller and smaller blocks. And you learn those little blocks slowly and then you put them together, just like a puzzle piece, you know? A puzzle piece, you, you're standing in front of a 2000 
it's funny I'm looking down here because right here there is actually a 3000 puzzle piece right <laughs> down here my sister is making it not me I'm not a big puzzle guy but right here there is one 3000 puzzle piece and I came here and saw my sister do it I was like how on earth because it looks so undoable that's exactly the same thing you look at a piece like it and you only see the small little pieces but if you put them step by step by step at the end you have a big puzzle piece and it's so logical and it all makes sense so you have to split it up when you split it up in small pieces that belong together and that are logical then it's actually totally doable and you have to see the math in the piece you know the connection between uh, the number of repetitions of, of notes with Uzoslavsky the, the key is the number five I don't want to say more than that but five is just going throughout the piece there's always everything is related to five somehow so once you understand those things it goes very fast cool I, I, I have to play it for the first time next year so I'm trying to figure it out I opened the score literally yesterday and I was just like this. I mean, in the beginning, I was like, when when you have this part of the, how I don't even know it yet. I was like, what well, does it go down up? I was trying to think like, okay, so two down, two up, because I, I just don't know how to approach this as a completely first experience. So I, my thought was, I'm just gonna go page by page or section by section and just learn that. One thing that and then will move on. calm you down um, maybe is I think the beginning is the hardest in terms of learning by heart. This cadence in the beginning is mm. on purpose written almost sometimes illogical because he wants this, this, this feeling of randomness, this feeling of different characters and, 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 and faces just moving by. So that has sometimes a certain randomness to it which is intentional and that is difficult. Later on the piece becomes much more logical, especially in the first, second movement, I mean second and third mm. movement, sorry. The end of it, again, it goes a little bit back into randomness, but the beginning cadence is probably the hardest and once you have that, um, the rest will be much, much easier, so don't, don't worry about that too much. Um, how precise do you need to be with the quarter tones? Do you need to be like killing That's that? Like, up to you, man. How far you want to <laughs> Do you need it? to hit one of them or it is... <laughs> oh man, it's just like... Um, I don't know how much is, I mean, I don't want to say it, but how much is worth it, how much can you actually hear? Uh, and uh, my first uh, thought was like, okay, we'll just hit the regular notes and the quarter tones, it will be a prox. So, because they are so close together, nothing fits. Uh, I just want to know if you went for it. And if you went for it, then I will try to go for it. If you talk, if you tell me, what like, ah, no, uh, uh, on, you are right. Random, you, no. I mean, both approaches are right. Of course, it's not, I think, possible or absolutely necessary to hit it mathematically as a quarter note. First of all, I think it's a form of expression that he uses, which is this sort of uncertainty, this between the notes, which is very important. And the second thing that you mentioned was also completely correct, that you keep the, the regular notes as a navigation tool. Um, what is, for example, the first time the, the quarter notes come right in the beginning and then it comes already there it is so of course with a B a B which is a clear, it has to be an in tune, a very clear B and then the next note shouldn't be it's already too high it has to be between, between the C and the B it, has, it just has to be in between. I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure that I'm not mathematically by frequency exactly 50% between them. I don't think that is really important. What is important is that you are kind of not, not sure whether it's a, a B or a C. It's this expression of like just almost laziness, weirdness. I think that is much more important to capture is the, the, um, the, the character than mathematically the quarter notes. I think that's what he was mainly going for. That's my approach at least. I hope there is not some kind of die-hard Lutoslavsky fans now getting really angry. I think it's important to capture the character <laughs> of the piece and try to get those quarter notes as precise as possible, but definitely get the character um, more, give the character more importance than the mathematical nailing of the quarter notes. Is there any story about the piece that I'm not aware of? Uh, any famous thing? This is my first time, so I'm, I'm completely new to the to, to even to his music i i think i haven't played any of his music not even the sacred variations um never had a lesson with any of music so i'm approaching it 
completely fresh. It, it feels really cool, actually. But uh, since you, you, you are a pro at Lutherlaski, uh, I want to know if there is any um, other... First of all, I don't, I don't consider myself a pro, but um, I just know some things about, um, I mean, first of all, people who don't even know who he is. We told, we told, or we, I don't know how to say his first name, I think it's we told Lutosławski, um, a Polish composer, 20th century composer, and this piece he wrote for Ostopovich, as many concertos in the 20th century are written for Ostopovich. And I think Lutosławski himself always insists that his piece, his music is absolute, meaning that it has no story, there is no program behind it, he doesn't want to you know, connect it to some sort of social event or political event. But still, I think, especially in this concerto, there is some general human, let's say, uh, philosophical motives that can be found and can be put into this music, I think, without upsetting Mr. Rutoslavsky too much. For me, it's very much the fight between an individual against the big mass. Of course, the individual in this case is the cellist, the soloist, and the big mass is the orchestra. Uh, that is, I think, quite obvious. And this piece really depicts that pretty well because throughout the piece, the cello just gets interrupted by the orchestra. It's not like a usual concerto where the orchestra takes over from the soloist, which I think maybe Brahms is the master of, of orchestras taking over, sometimes in the middle of the phrase, in double concerto, think about that. Sometimes you practice the solo part and like, wait, I, I just stopped in the middle of the phrase, this makes no sense, but then you play with orchestra, you're like, oh wow, okay, I'm just giving it to them and they're continuing, it's such a harmony. Everything is about harmony with Brahms. Zuzlavsky, and especially this piece, is actually quite the opposite. It's, it's, it's about conflict, it's exactly the opposite of harmony. So the orchestra is not there to support you, it's actually there to interrupt you most of the time, which makes this piece really special. It really makes it a battle between you and the orchestra. And then, of course, there is places where harmony seems possible. It's almost like, wait, maybe there is hope for us. Maybe there is a chance for us to play together. That is, especially in the slow movement, that sometimes the orchestra gets together and then the climax of the slow movement is actually, for the first time, everybody really does play together and it's so beautiful for a moment but then very quickly it turns into craziness and then the last movement is really just a war between you and the orchestra so it's really taking the concerto to a level which very few composers have done which is really usually a concerto is about I mean our understanding is the beautiful harmony playing together but this is the opposite of the yeah. concerto as form of a battle between the soloist and the orchestra. I think that for me was the approach. Everyone can have their own story, but I think the way it, he wrote this piece very much indicates that for me. That's completely the way I understand his music. But that's not what he said himself, because he likes to stay silent about his music, which is great, so you can put your own story there. So that's all that we have for you today. A special episode of Talking Cello with Kian Soltanin, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Let us know again in the comments what would you like us to talk next. Uh, this is completely, actually, it's quite improvised and free, but if you guys give us some topics uh, to lead the conversation, then cool. And just uh, see you guys in the next one.